coming. The truth is, we're grateful for you letting us come, and uh, we're looking forward to a great time together. Uh, this is my, the ninth time my wife and I have been up here for the summer. For, we've also made it, of course, with our choir tour this last year, and a lot of the young people who were up with us uh, wanted to send their greetings to you and, and tell you they were thinking of you and also uh, take that from them. I don't know about you, but after traveling a little bit and being out in the out of doors and then uh, finally getting to sleep last night, I toss and turn a bit and finally I fell asleep and then I woke up a time or two and then some of the girls in the next room were talking too much and that woke me up. And uh, I set the alarm and like a nut, I put the alarm right up next to my head and when it went off, I woke up with a headache, you know, one of those. And then you sit here today, and it's, it's warm in here, and it's comfortable, and all the rest, and I find myself just not quite 100% alert, right? Well, let's clear our minds a little bit. Now, they don't have you stand and sing on the hymns here so much. And uh, down, down home, they always have you stand on the last hymn before the message, and I think they do that to wake everybody up so when the pastor comes up, it, everybody's fresh. But maybe we can do something different. Uh, we need you to clear your minds before we start this morning. We did this with the people before, and some of them can't add without taking off their shoes, so uh, <laughs> we're in real trouble. But I want you to choose a number between 1 and 10. Will you do that, and don't tell anybody what number you chose, okay? Any number between 1 and 10. You can't, that doesn't include 0 for some of you who are trying to fake me out here. Now I want you to double that number. Okay. Can you add 4? It's getting harder now. Now divide that in half. Okay? Now take your original number that you started with and subtract it from the number that you were at there. Can you do that? Well, some of you are in panic. <laughs> this is not a test. <laughs> now we're going to see how well you did. How many came up with two? <laughs> Terrific! How many would have raised your hand no matter what I asked? <laughs> oh! That's great. Boy, I did that down home, and the first time everybody looked at me and said, I can't believe that. Isn't that right? And some of the young people, yeah, some of them are getting awful bashful here because they, they couldn't figure it. Well, let's try it again. Choose another number, but not the same one. Huh? All right, I want you to double it again. Let's add uh, six this time. That's this many for those of you that are trying to figure that out, okay? <laughs> now divide it in half. And subtract your original number that you started with from that number. I ought to ask what each of you got and see if we came up with the same answer. But how many came up with three? All right, we're doing pretty good. A few hands didn't go up over here, but all right. See, now you got your mind all in gear. We can start. Isn't that great? It makes you different. There are people who find courage in it. It relieves pain for a while, yet it's one of the biggest killers of modern man. It can make one feel humorous. It gives others strength in order to be able to beat upon their families and friends. It can rob money that is needed by loved ones. It controls and possesses the, so that you are not your own. It's been said that 82% of all crime committed today is by men under the influence of alcohol. The Chicago Tribune kept track for 10 years and found that 53,556 murders were committed by men under its influence. 80% of poverty is caused by alcohol. Men come to where they're transformed into irresponsible, dangerous, evil-smelling brutes. And the information I just gave you was given out over 60 years ago by Billy Sunday in one of the messages that he used to preach. So the totals and everything are even more today. Isn't that fascinating? Alcohol. Well... The point is this. In Scripture, we find that Scriptures itself gives an illustration to us of how much of a fanatic, I guess we could use the word, we are to be for the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a familiar verse, and if you'll look, please, to Ephesians chapter 5. 
And we'll look at the illustration that the scriptures itself give about our being filled with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 5, and we're looking at verse number 18. It says, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And we'd like to look at that verse for just a few minutes this morning, and then will be dismissed. And I would like very much, I know I recognize almost everybody. There's a few faces that are new to me, and I promise not to scare you, but I'd like to get acquainted afterwards. That'd be great. We start out here, it says, Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled. Let's look at those two words, be filled, for just a moment. The disciples and the apostles were filled by the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. They were filled in Samaria and at Caesarea and at Ephesus. And read the accounts in the scriptures. And we also read when Stephen was stoned to death, it says just before he gave up the ghost, he was filled with the Spirit and he looked up into heaven and saw Lord Jesus Christ. He was filled with the Spirit. And Paul records several times that he was filled with the Spirit. So it must be something that's done more than once. Well, it apparently happened several times to the apostles and the disciples. Let's see a little bit more about it. First of all, it is a command that's given here. It says, but be filled. It is a command. You see? And it's exciting because we're not to be dead and boresome, and our services ought to be something that's glorious. I remember a preacher saying one time, he was, I was at a, a camp down in the southern part of the states for a conference and he got up and he was talking to preachers about their services and he said we're so careful to start them at 11 o'clock sharp and end them at 12 o'clock dull <laughs> and he was right there was nothing in them to draw you to the Lord and draw your your thoughts to him it was all pure entertainment and uh, uh, when you got all done you went out with a good feeling because you had gone to church but you hadn't had yourself drawn to the Lord well, our services ought to be exciting simply because there are times when we find ourselves drawn to His Word and then drawn to Him. And our hymn singing, oh boy, I love hymns and good music. And it's wonderful to have that. But it ought to draw us not to the person who's singing it, but instead the words and the melody ought to lift us to the Lord, you see. Well, we're worshiping God Almighty, and we ought to sparkle. We ought to be alive for God. Um, and people ought to feel a spiritual fire when they come near us. You see, we are different. It was interesting. I was asking about the sign up here. Well, that's beautiful. That's really beautiful. But I notice it's not made out of wood anymore. And they tell me they have to put them in with steel posts. They see so many of these around the area that people are going around with chainsaws and cutting them down. So they can put steel posts up. That'll slow them down a little bit, you know. Um, people are beginning to see that there's somebody that's different out there. I mean, there's, there's religious fanatics out there sharing about God. I mean, they put these signs up and you see places like this where you can come and worship and there's some churches around. I mean... After all, we've got to put a stop to them. Well, people ought to know that we're here because we are different. But it says here that we're to be filled. It's a command, be ye filled. And we learn that it's continuously. We are to be filled continuously. We're so often up and down in our spiritual lives and we're often dead and dull. Whereas we ought to be happy and we ought to be praising God and serving Christ all of the time. Today, tonight, Monday, and always. It's sometimes it's very hard to serve the Lord and do it joyfully. Years ago, I had the privilege of working on a, on a ranch out in Nebraska. And uh, it was like a missionary internship. And I'd gone out there, and I, I was just thrilled to pieces with a chance to work out in the western United States because I love horses and I love all that sort of stuff. And that was just, that was great. Just couldn't have asked for it to be better. So... Um, we were in the process of building a camp on this ranch. We had a thousand acres, actually 965, uh, 65, but uh, we call it a thousand acre ranch, okay? And um, we we're going to build a camp. So I went to the missionary and said, okay, what do you want me to do? And he smiled at me and I knew I was in trouble for having asked. 
And he says, well, I want you to go and I want you to buy so much lumber and nails and uh, get yourself a hammer and saw and I want you to build three outhouses. I thought, I'm going to the mission field to build outhouses? I just can't get excited about this at all. You know, I mean, there's got to be better things to do. And then he got so bold as to say, by the way, we have one that's already built, but it's full and I want you to move it. <laughs> and I had a long struggle with that for a few days. Uh, not with the outhouse, I mean with the project, you see. And I can remember, finally one night, uh, a lot of canyons out in there, and you get out in a canyon, you can get lost, because they just kind of whine forever. But uh, I happened to know where this one was, and there was a full moon out, and you could see a little bit, so I started walking, and I started talking out loud to the Lord. I was just disgusted. I came 1,100 miles to work for the Lord, and what kind of a job do I get building outhouses? And I was just frustrated. But I started, and all of a sudden, the Lord started to speak to me, and I started to sing and pray and finally get some things squared around in my own heart because I'd had a pretty bad attitude about the whole thing. And all of a sudden, I realized, you know, they've got to have them. <laughs> Can you imagine having 30, 40, 50 young people come to camp and have no outhouses? I mean, they've got to have them, so somebody's got to build them. Why not you? And the more I thought about that, I thought, why can't I have some fun doing this too? And so I started designing outhouses. <laughs> now, I had a church back home that was helping support me a little bit, and I even wrote them a letter about the outhouses I was designing, and the people back home got into it so much that one fellow even found a catalog of outhouses that was all out of date, but he sent it to me, along with a package of flowers to plant along the path on this thing. <laughs> And I just had a riot. I started taking pictures of these things and sending them home, and people couldn't believe it. Here's Dave out there building outhouses and having a great time doing it. And the Lord changed my attitude, and I realized, you know, even doing the things that we don't really want to do, we can so allow the Lord to fill us that we can enjoy it and enjoy ourselves completely, and it rubs off on everybody else, because pretty soon, believe it or not, I had people who wanted to come and help me build outhouses. I wasn't alone in my project. Now, I don't dare go any further in that story because my wife has given me dirty looks, but uh, it was quite, a, uh, quite an opportunity. I mean, it was great. But we're to be filled, it's a command, and we're to, it's to be done continuously. And it says also in there, we learn in the Greek that it's to be all of us. All of you is to be filled. It includes all, and it's a quickening power that moves in all of us, and people ought to be able to see it. Well... There's another part here. We learn that we're to be given over in utter abandonment. It's not only a command, and it's not only continuous, and it's not only plural for all of us. It's also passive. We are being acted upon. Isn't that neat? The Spirit of God's acting upon us. We request Him, we desire of Him to come in and fill us, and He does that in and through us. Now, when you're saved, you receive the Holy Spirit. We know that. But you know what happens to a lot of us when sin comes? We kind of push the Holy Spirit out of one portion of our life here. And we don't confess that, and we, we hold Him down in that area of our life. And then we have sin come in, and we push Him out in this area over. And pretty soon, we, have, we still have the Holy Spirit, but He's not filled us. We've kind of taken Him out of certain areas of our life. And this filling involves us turning ourselves completely back over to Him and opening up all the doors of our life and letting Him have control in all areas, you see. Totally given over to Him. Some time ago, there was a cantata, a Christmas cantata that was published. And the composer took the words taken from Luke chapter 1. And uh, I want to just read that. You don't have to turn there. You can keep your finger in the uh, book of Ephesians there. But in Luke chapter 1, he took a portion of Scripture here. And um, it was Mary reflecting back to what the Holy Spirit and the Lord and God and all was going to do in and through her with the birth of the baby Jesus, you see. And she started out by saying this, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. For he hath regarded the lowest state of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. 
For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He hath showed great strength into his arm, and hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts, and hath put down the mighty from their seats, and exalted them of low degree. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent empty away. He hath opened his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spake to our fathers, to Abram, and to his seed forever. In the song, they repeated that one phrase that started that, that Mary shared. My soul doth magnify the Lord. And it repeated it over and over and began to build it to a point where you're just lifted right out of your seats with the orchestration behind it and the thought of lifting our souls and rejoicing to God Almighty. And the words that were given by the composer over that phrase to the choir was, sing this in utter abandonment. In other words, let yourself go in total praise to God as you sing this portion. My soul doth magnify the Lord. It was exciting. It was really exciting. Well, this is what he's asking us to do here. Turn ourselves completely over in praise to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it happens like someone who is filled with alcohol. They turn themselves completely over to it, don't they? I never have felt called to minister on a full-time basis in the rescue missions. It takes a special person to be able to do that on a regular basis. If you've ever visited a city rescue mission and seen the people that they have to deal with, it's very, very difficult ministry. But many times I've been asked to go down and speak and to share, and I've taken the opportunities. But to see a man seated there who can hardly hold himself up and he's got vomit all over him and he's been sleeping in the gutter all because of alcohol, that's a diff difficult person to have to deal with. And what has happened is he has given himself completely over to that and it has controlled him. It controls his speech, it controls his thoughts, controls his actions, it controls him. Well, we learn here that we are commanded continuously, all of us, to be given over in utter abandonment to the Lord Jesus Christ and the filling of the Holy Spirit. And in the filling of the Holy Spirit. Well, just how can we know that we are filled? Well, there are several things we can look at. I enjoy verse 19 of this chapter. We read verse 18. Look at verse 19. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. I think one of the things of a person that's truly turned over to the Lord Jesus Christ and filled is they are joyful and music will come. They may hum. Maybe the only music they can do is... Uh, something they, they do when they're in the shower or something so nobody else hears, I don't know. But I think the music will come forth. Do you know there's over 500 references to music in the Scriptures? Over 500. Music is important. And when someone is truly filled with the Holy Spirit, it just kind of bubbles out of them. And I don't think the Lord is too concerned of whether it's totally in tune or not. He's more concerned about our heart attitude when it comes music it's one of the fruits of the spirit Galatians 5:22, and it's a deep experience of confidence in spite of circumstances around us There's a little poem that says trials must and will befall but with humble faith to see love inscribed upon them all that is happiness to me you see it's not afraid to express the deep joy of one's relationship to the glory of God and I think also that we will learn that that person is thankful. Look at verse 20 now. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, even for building outhouses. Even for building outhouses. Did you know that the state of Nebraska requires outhouses to be fly tight and fully ventilated and have spring loaded doors? I mean, those outhouses were Cadillacs. They were wonderful. I had a ball. 
But I learned to be thankful even having to do all of those crazy things. And I think the Lord finally could see that I really meant it because I had such a good time with it and other people could see it. I think a person who truly loves the Lord and is filled will be thankful for all things, even the hard things. Being enriched because of others and humbly acknowledging God as the giver of every good and perfect gift. He's given us it all. Pontiac, we don't refer to Pontiac much anymore. We'd rather be called Auburn Hills. You see, ever since the riots in Pontiac and the city downtown falling to pieces, no one wants to be known as having come from Pontiac as such, okay? And Auburn Hills was a way of saying it's a new city and it's different and it's clean and and all the rest it's exciting we're part of Auburn Hills not Pontiac any longer well uh, God has given us some good things even in Auburn Hills he's blessed us abundantly there he really has and uh, I love coming up here because I see the beauty of God all throughout the hillsides and the lakes and in the people and it's grand to come up here too see because you see, God's blessing isn't limited just to Auburn Hills or to Gooley River. It's it's everywhere that we, we look for it. It's there, you see. Well, we also learn that uh, the person here will be submissive. Uh, he's joyful, he's thankful, and he's submissive. Look at verses 21 to 33. It's a long passage, but let me read it for you. Submitting yourselves to one another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself. And the wife see that she reverence her husband. A person who's filled is submissive. Now this has nothing to do with throwing weight and authority around. It Instead, it governs the operation of authority. It's how it is given and how it is received. It builds people up. It's not using authority to make oneself important. Isn't that neat? Isn't that exciting? Be filled with the Spirit. Well, let's review quickly, and then we'll be done. We read here, Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. It's a command. Be filled. Be filled. Secondly, it's continuously. We must do it again. We must constantly cleanse ourselves, confess our sin, and restore all the areas of our life open to the controlling and ruling of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit in our lives. All of us. Wouldn't it be exciting if everybody walked out of this little chapel here today filled with the Holy Spirit and excited and just kind of moved out through the community and people could see it and experience and enjoy it? And we're to do it in utter abandonment, giving ourselves completely over to it. Oh, that's exciting. It's exciting. Being joyful, thankful, and submissive. Sounds like a tall order, doesn't it? Well, I don't think it needs to be. I think it could be very simply stated like this, let go and let God. So often we try and do it on our own, make it on our own, when instead if we just let the Lord handle it and then follow as he directs it would it would happen it would be so much easier let go and let God well consider what he's done for you and for me 
I certainly don't deserve his love, and I'm sure you would say the same. And yet I find that he gave it so fully and freely. One of the hymns that I really enjoy, and I just want to read some of the verses to you, is the hymn found on page 44 of your hymn book. It says, And can it be that I should gain? Think about the words here as, as we share them with you. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain? For me, who him to death pursued. Hmm. He left his father's throne above, and so free, so infinite was his grace, that he emptied himself of all but love and bled for Adam's helpless race. There's no condemnation now that I dread. I am my Lord's, and he is mine. Alive in him, my living head, and clothed in righteousness divine. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Oh, I don't deserve it, but he's offered it. Why not take it and enjoy it? Be filled with the Spirit. Do the impossible for God. It is something that God does for us and in us and with us. And are you willing? I trust that you are. Let's bow for prayer. Father, thank you so very, very much for the privilege of worshiping together with fellow Christians. Father, we have felt a bond in Jesus Christ with these people for many years now. And it's wonderful to see some new faces and to see the love of the Lord Jesus Christ in this place. And for the privilege we have of sharing in that for two weeks. And we pray that you will be our portion in all that is said and done during that time that we might find ourselves growing closer to the Lord and each of those that are here the same. Father, we want so very much to be filled and to be used of thee. We want to give ourselves over and be controlled of you finding ourselves living, walking, serving you daily. It's not just something that we do on Sunday to be of good appearance to our neighbors. It's something we do because we love you and we desire to serve you and have you first in our lives Monday through Saturday as well as Sunday. Thank you for your love and for your watch care. Continue to mold and make us in thy perfect will, Father, for it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Thank you.